first here on the matter of the State Board of Review for the defense motion for continuance as well as the bond for the continuance of the two motions as well as the um, documentation that was provided by the defense in support of their motion as well as the state's response. Does either side have anything else they want to add to their written pleadings? Okay. Melissa McNeil on behalf of Nicholas Cruz. Tamara Curtis on behalf of Nicholas Cruz. Nicholas Chaconi on behalf of the state. Okay. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Good afternoon. All right, let me get you ready. Judge, first, um, last week, I believe it was, we had asked for an evidentiary hearing, although we objected to having the hearing set um, today or, or so quickly so, uh, because we were not able to get or didn't think we would be able to get our witnesses here on such short notice and so close to the holidays. And that is, in fact, the situation. We were unable to bring in uh, witnesses that we wanted to have testify for the court. So instead, we filed uh, affidavits. But we did intend to and wanted to have uh, an evidentiary hearing where we could present live testimony to the court. Um, that being said, <coughs> We really only need to address, I believe, a couple of points in the state's response. Um, the state's purported objection to our motion for continuance appears to be based on an inaccurate reading of Chief Judge Tudor's administrative orders. The chief judge nowhere in those orders declares this case a priority requiring an expeditious resolution. In other words, the chief judge does not state in either of those orders that this case needs to get to trial in an expedited manner or any other manner. The first order that the judge signed was, <clears throat> the purpose of that was to ensure that only this court presided over matters other than warrants in this case and then outlined a procedure if this court is not available. Um, <clears throat> the court does, or the chief judge does not cite to subsection G of Rule of Judicial Administration 2.215, which talks about other types of cases that do need to be decided expeditiously. He cites to other sections, and those are sections that govern his administrative power. The chief judge wouldn't have the authority under the Constitution or under the laws of Florida to tell this court it needs to try this case in an expeditious manner. The second order signed by the by the chief judge is basically to <coughs> excuse me ensure that given the court that the court had set a trial date to ensure that given the massiveness of this case the amount of, of interest the media need for security any of those things to make sure that this court was given priority with respect to jurors and <coughs> excuse me space, court space, and all of that. It has nothing to do with telling anyone that this case needs to be tried in an expeditious manner. The, the other point that we wanted to make, Judge, is that, uh, and only because, uh, you know, we, we believe that our motion contains all of the relevant law, facts, and argument that we need. However, the state says that this is not a complex case. And the basis for that is because there's an admission and because his guilt is evident, or, or whatever their, their exact language is. That is not relevant to whether a case is complex. Judge, any capital case, and the Supreme Court has said that, Florida Supreme Court has said that, the ABA has said that, all of the experts that we provided affidavits from discuss the complexity of capital cases. They are all complex. And this case, even more so, based on the media attention and the impact on the community, will require more strategies and motions to eliminate any, any hindrance of his fair trial. So it, it, the reason why we think these are important points 
to uh, eliminate for the board is because down the road we may end up being in the same situation. So any reliance on Judge Tudor's orders is misplaced and any notions that this case is not complex um, need to be dispelled at this point. May I respond? Are you doing it? Or not? Okay. First and foremost, my response is not just based exclusively on Judge Tudor's administrative order. However, I disagree with the defense's interpretation of it. Um, it is governed by rule of Florida Rule of Judicial Administration 2.215, and in subsection G, a duty to expedite priority cases. Every judge has a duty to expedite priority cases to the extent reasonably possible. Priority cases are those cases that have been assigned a priority status or assigned an expedited disposition schedule, which is what the court or what the chief judge has done in this case. The media attention that's been going on, that's not going to go away. With respect to the complexity of it, again, I disagree with the defense. Um, yes, it is voluminous, but it is not complex. It is on video, there's photographs, there's an admission. Just because it's a capital case, that doesn't make it a complex case necessarily. The case law that they've cited is clear about that. And furthermore, th th we can make this very simple, Judge. We're, we're not objecting to moving this trial to May of 2020. Uh, the state is, I don't agree that there's a legal basis to do so, but we're not objecting to it being moved. As far as the affidavits that have been filed, just because they're in the record, that does not make them evidence. I cannot cross-examine them. And they, each of those affidavits gives an opinion of interpretation of the law, which is not proper, uh, subject to, uh, not proper subject of expert testimony. That's for your honor to determine resolution of legal issues. And that is not to be done by way of expert opinion. And I have case law the court is interested. So um, I think I've responded to the defense's points as of now. But we are not objecting to moving this trial to May 2020. Um, Judge, just to follow up on the state of Florida's argument that Judge Tudor has made a declaration, um, which they referred to in their motion twice, that this is a priority status case. Um, I'd like to draw the court's attention to the court order dated October 22nd of 2019. Um, it's Administrative Order 2019-82. The court is familiar with the order. It's attached as an exhibit to the state's motion. In that um, order, which, as Mrs. Curtis has indicated, was uh, generated after the court had set a court date, um, the order itself says implementation of certain additional procedural guidelines to ensure sufficient and expedient resolution of the trial, Judge. So what the court did, and you were probably either aware of this or part of it, um, Judge Tudor has met with the clerk's office, said, these are the dates, how we're going to do summons. This is the security that needs to be provided by Borough Sheriff's Office. Nowhere in that order does he indicate or does he maintain, as the state alleges in their motion, paragraph 3, that in order to maintain this case as a priority status. So the, the reason why we bring this up, Judge, and, and the state makes a similar argument, argument in paragraph 9 when it says that this court should disregard all of the cases that we cited in our motion to continue, the cases that the court has before them, other criminal cases, um, they, they said that you should ignore that, that that's irrelevant, because Judge Tudor has designated this case a priority. That is not true. There is no declaration. There is uh, none of those administrative orders indicate or designate, declare, or order that this is a priority case. So when the, case re when the state relies on Judge Tudor's administrative orders and, and makes a 100% inaccurate assertion based on those administrative orders to disregard our arguments as to the relevancy of the other cases that are before the court that are being treated differently than Mr. Cruz's, it's inaccurate. So I think that that needs to be cleared up, crystally clear, crystal clear that Judge Tudor has never made that declaration. And the other thing that I think is important, and we, there is a footnote in our motion to continue because repeatedly throughout the pendency of this case, the state of Florida has made representations that there are seven, eight, nine public defenders that are on this case. In our motion, in a footnote, we have advised the court, and this is a motion that we all signed, 
as to who is assigned and responsible for the litigation of the state of Florida, uh, state of Florida versus Nicholas Cruz. There are four attorneys, Judge, two of which have filed notices of appearance. So this representation by the state that they know more about who is doing what in our case is inaccurate. I want the court to know that there are four assigned attorneys. We've had more than four or five pleadings. Yes, we've had multiple pleadings. But there are four defense attorneys that are assigned to this case. That's it. There's nobody else full-time on this case. Do we employ the services of other individuals in our office? Absolutely. The same way that the state attorney's office does. But we are, we are the primary counsel and responsible for the pleadings that are filed in this case and the litigation. So I just want the court to be fully aware of what, who comprises the defense team on a full-time basis. Okay. Just, Judge, if the state is now saying that, you know, I don't have the opportunity to cross-examine these experts and these experts shouldn't be rendering legal opinions. They are experts in capital defense. That is what they've rendered opinions on. And if the state wanted the opportunity to cross-examine our experts, then it should have agreed to having the hearing at a time when we could bring them in. Giving us one week to fly in experts from all over the country is not reasonable. Your Honor, this is a motion to continue. We don't need experts for a motion to continue. Okay. They have their legal opinion. I just wanted to add, if I may, that what the defense hasn't provided is what is considered a reasonable amount of time. It is not anywhere. They don't want to give a date. So two and a half years having been on notice, that's what's unique about this case. Everyone, all the parties have been on notice since February of 2018 that this case was to be tried in 2020. And nothing that they've cited says that that is an improper or unreasonable amount of time, not any code, not any rule, not any statute, not any case. So unless they're going to give us a date to just have it out there in infinity, that is unreasonable. Again, the state is not objecting, but we're asking for a May 2020 date. And we want the court to know that we would like to get a resolution to this case also. I'm that, not, not going to set it out indefinitely. And nor am I asking you to, Judge. We're doing everything we can to get this case ready for trial. We have a hiccup right now because we have pleadings before the Florida Supreme Court. Absent that, we're doing everything we can to proceed on this case. I have never had a capital case where there has been a date certain when we're still doing discovery. I'm not saying that we can't have an ideal date to look towards. I get that. It encourages all the parties to work together, which I believe we have been doing with the state of Florida and the court. But when you mentioned the date of January, we just said it's not a realistic date. And it turns out it's not. We just want to set something that's reasonable. We don't want this to go into 2021 unless it has to, Judge. We would like to have this case resolved by the end of next year. That is our goal. It has always been our goal. So we're not asking for infinity, Judge. We understand that this needs to be resolved. So realistically, there is a matter pending before the Florida Supreme Court, which neither myself nor either of the parties has any control over whether they are going to uh, rule on that matter. Because of that, practically speaking, in and of itself, is the reason that I have to continue this matter, I believe. Um, not to mention the fact that the state is also agreeing that the case should be continued, which is more than agreed. Assuming that the Florida Supreme Court matter is resolved, uh, I did read in the state's response that the public, the elected public defender said that your office would be ready by by summer. Is that correct? Judge, it has always been our goal to be able to start this trial. Did he say that? Um, I, it, it's in the editorial. He did say that, Judge. Um, However, so as lead counsel of this case, I can advise the court that we are doing everything within our power to achieve. Um, an end of 2020 court date, and I'm daily and intimately familiar with the pleadings that are filed in this case. It's not as if Mr. Um, Finkelstein spoke out of turn. He did not. He's familiar with the facts and the litigation. But a realistic trial date can be set in 2020, but I do not believe that May is um, a practical date. Uh, that would be the two-year mark in which we had received discovery, uh, but I think that we would be in the same position as we are right now. We have doubled up our depositions, as the court is probably aware, by looking at the clerk's computer. Um, we are working ourselves to the bones, and the state is too. They're there all along the way. Uh, I just think that instead of creating false hope in this community, like has already been done with the January date, that we just be realistic. If you set a court date in the end of May, 
I'm sorry, in the end of March, a status, then I think by then we will be in a better position to enlighten the court as to where we stand. You are aware of all the pleadings we filed and all the depositions that we're taking. I mean, you know that we're working. What about the motion, the, the motion um, period that I set aside for January? Can any of those motions be heard during that time period? We can. We have been working on some motions, but in all candor, the, the motion to continue required myself and Ms. Curtis and multiple other attorneys. It took us about four weeks to generate that motion, which resulted in us putting aside the other work relating to the litigation. Um, a lot of those motions depend on depositions that have not been taken. We, in good faith, will file anyone, any motions that we believe can be argued without um, depositions that have not been taken. But I, I, if the court is looking to make a if you want to hold up two weeks in January, I don't think that that would be a good use of the court's time. I don't think that we will be taking up that much time with our motions. We need a date to work with. Um, obviously, no date is set in stone. Things happen. I, I didn't know that the Florida Supreme Court would be taking so long to make a decision. Uh, maybe we'll in the meantime, I'm going to put it on for a calendar call on March the 23rd at 1 o'clock. Is that spring break, Judge? I don't know. Um, if there's a conflict, I'll let you know. Okay. So March 23rd at 1 o'clock. For a calendar call, but I'm going to tell you all now. Don't I, I don't want to hear come March that parties are busy, parties are doing other things in the month uh, during the summer months because this case is going to be tried this summer at some point. Uh, I'm not going to set a date right now, but please don't set anything else. We're not judged. Okay. Like I'm telling you, the four attorneys that are assigned to this case work on this case every single day. It's, a, it's the only case. We are doing everything that we can to um, make sure that we move this case along without the expense of Mr. Cruz's constitutional rights to due process. All right, March 23rd for a status or a calendar call, and I'll see you all then. Verona, may we address the other case briefly? Okay. Good afternoon, Your Honor. I do uh, respectfully disagree that the case is ready. We have uh, the most important deposition uh, in the entire case, the alleged victim, Sergeant Beltran. That is scheduled for January 3rd. Okay. Um, we also have another witness scheduled for deposition on January 3rd. It's hard for me, or actually both of us, to know exactly what work remains on the case because I don't really know what Sergeant Beltran is going to say in response to some of our questions. Obviously, we have a lot of important questions for him. What we were proposing was maybe a court date in the middle of January. By that point in time, we will have taken the deposition of Sergeant Beltran. And we'll have a much better idea about when we can actually try this case. Sorry. I didn't know that the witness was proposed yet. Why hadn't the witness been proposed yet? Well, there's a few reasons. Uh, I think he was actually scheduled for the 21st of December. Um, there was a conflict with the prosecutor, so we rescheduled to the third. We wanted to wait because, first of all, he has a uh, pending internal affairs investigation. We don't have materials from those from that investigation yet. It hasn't been completed. In addition, uh, he was also arrested for driving under the influence in the state of Washington. It took us a while to get those materials because after he was arrested, it took some time before the state of Washington actually filed charges against him. He had to get a warrant results from the, uh, the blood test. So it wasn't like uh, he was arrested immediately there after he was charged with DUI. So well, we have those materials now, um, So, but we didn't want to take his deposition without having them. So obviously we have some important questions for him. So what day is the deposition scheduled? Uh, January 3rd, I believe. I think it's January 3rd. So I'll put the case on. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll put it on for a status. I'll put the case on for a status on January 13th at 1 o'clock. Just, I think uh, under these circumstances, we can just put the, the uh, newer case on. I don't think both cases need to be on the docket for that day, do you? No. And that is 
Judge, before we recess, did um, you set a trial date on his other case, his aggravated battery case, yeah. if that's for January 27th? Correct. I just wanted to make it clear we're, we're objecting to that. We will submit um, additional grounds in writing. You don't have to do that. This is a, okay. Every calendar call in this division, we have a proposed trial date so that the state can send subpoena, the defense can send subpoena. So I'm telling you, calendar call is the 13th, with the proposed trial date of the 27th. And like I said uh, just a few minutes ago, if you need more time, you can let me know on the 13th, and then I will change uh, perhaps the trial date. But do you see what I'm saying? Yes, I just didn't want anyone reviewing the transcript to think they were acquiescing to that date. So that's why I wanted to object. Okay. All right. Thank you. We're Thank you, Judge. Thank you. 